Hello the world, hello the internet, uh, hello interested people in politics and particularly in conservatism and hopefully those who have looked already at my introduction to ideologies video and uh, my introduction to conservatism video. This is the second in a series of four videos on conservatism. Uh, we're going through them chronologically essentially. So we had our general introduction, this is the second chronologically, this is traditional conservatism. Uh, and um, it's the first of the real sort of ideological uh, schools that you need to understand as you uh, progress through um, through the course and uh, looking at the development of conservatism uh, into the modern ideology that we sort of know today. Okay, so let's put it all in context. Uh, we've got to look at the British situation first of all, and we're looking at the English Civil War, we're looking at the Glorious Revolution, we're looking at the agricultural and industrial revolution that's led to a very much polarized society. And uh, we're also looking at the French Revolution. So here we're looking at a, a, a quite a long time there. You've got 200 odd years of uh, profound change. And as I said in my previous uh, video on the introduction to conservatism, you know, the British response to this has been very much a sort of bodge. We've staggered our way through it. We had, we had the Civil War, which was terrible. Uh, we had the Glorious Revolution, which was pretty successful. Between then, we had you know a number of kings come and go. Um, James II, who we got rid of, and then we uh, in, invited the Hanoverians over. So um, we, we had our flirtation with, with big ideas. Let's get rid of the king. And uh, that didn't work particularly well. And so we're, we're, we're kind of reverse at this point to uh, big projects, to big ideas. You know, life would be so much better if only we could get rid of the king. Oh, no, it turns out that was wrong. Then we look across and we see in France exactly the same thing is happening. They said, OK, we've got some really profound problems in France. Let's have a revolution. And uh, obviously they beheaded an awful lot more people than we did. But the thing that followed from that was not necessarily uh, or not immediately, obviously, better than what went before. In fact, the terror was, well, that, that kind of says it in the name. So from the UK, we've been looking at the difference between our history and France's history. We, we, we had this terrible terrible moment in the middle of the 17th century when everything went really really nasty and since then we sort of recovered we got back on this sort of steady state where we we'd had Charles II the party king he was fun then we got James II who was useless and so we got rid of him and um, then we uh, then we invited the Hanoverians over and what we've had ever since then as I said in my previous video was it was a more or less peaceful transition uh, from one administration to the next again uh, perhaps not so uh, peaceful in Ireland, but we'll, we'll, we'll come to that uh, perhaps in a later presentation. And um, so we'd got to this point where over however many years we'd had a period of stability um, that had given rise to the agricultural revolution and the industrial revolution, uh, but that had suddenly resulted in this very, very polarized society. We had the very, very rich and the very, very poor. And at the same time, we can look over to France and we can see that they're going through their particular um, awkward phase. And um, suddenly big ideas are back in vogue, liberté, égalité, fraternité, and, and we're start, starting to see mutterings as well uh, in the UK of dissatisfaction uh, with, uh, with, with, the, with the current social settlement, with the civil state uh, as it was. So this is the background to our traditional conservatism. And the two Libyathans, if you excuse the pun here, uh, are um, Hobbes and... Uh, Hobbes and um, Burke. So Hobbes, great work there. Uh, Leviathan, life outside the civil state or the social contract. He famously said that that was one of, it was one that was nasty, brutish, solitary, and short. He also described it as a war of you know, all against all. So what we're seeing here is someone who'd lived through the civil war and he'd seen what happened when uh, when, when the state's authority dissolved and it just became uh, literally battle royale. So this was Hobbes's context he had been through the civil war and he knew what life was like and, and without the state he argued covenants without swords about words so you know he very much believed in the nature of the state but critically it wasn't an autocratic state it was still a state of the people and uh, leviathan was this monstrous figure who was made up of the people and so the state in that sense was held to represent uh, the people and um, 
in terms of that notion of state authority, it, it, there's very much a sense of pragmatism, responsibility there. It's not that the state isn't there to exercise its will uh, as it sees uh, w without without consequence, but rather there's an obligation on the state to attend to the well-being of society. So there's a pragmatic response or a pragmatic element in that authority. Edmund Burke, a little bit later, uh, but uh, his book was Reflections on the Revolution in France, and his, his key theme there is organic society, the idea that we have this organic, growing, learning, evolving entity that we must, above all else, protect, because that's our repository of wisdom. That's, that's how we get out of this, basically. That's the win. If we look after organic society, then that will store all of our wisdom and our experience, and it will guide us through uh, into the next phase. And we need to learn to love the little platoons to which we belong. But obviously we need that sense of change and Burke's great contribution there was that uh, uh, the state without means of change is means without, oh, well, you can read it, it's late and um, I'll let you guys do that. Okay, so remember when you're writing your essays you need to drop in a couple of these thinkers at some point. You don't need to go into them in much detail, you really just have to name check them and mention what they think about the particular area that you're discussing in that essay at that given time. So if you're talking about traditional conservatism and the human condition then obviously you can say that Burke uh, so Hobbes was of the opinion that life outside of the uh, outside of the organized state was nasty British solitary and short. You can argue that Burke, on the other hand, saw organic society as the key model that uh, yeah, that contract between those who've been before us, those who are coming and those of us now who are doing the work. But this state as the ongoing uh, repository uh, of knowledge. Good. So on with uh, conservatism. And what we're going to do throughout all of these is that we're going to start off by looking at human nature because whatever you think about human nature is going to define the shape of your economy and your society and the shape of your economy and your society is going to determine in turn what you expect of the state. So we're going to look at the human, human nature first, society second, the economy third and then the fourth will be the state and how it manages society and the economy. As we go through all of these ideologies we're going to stick to the same uh, regime. Good. So let's start off with human imperfection. And human imperfection needs to be seen in three specific areas. I think as we discussed in our introduction to conservatism, intellectual limitations, psychological dependent, and then these psychological flaws, rational but psychologically flawed. I, I, I'm really trying to resist arguing that conservatives think that humanity is bad because I genuinely don't think they do. I think we, are, we, we try to be good, but we keep getting it wrong because we have this present bias. We know what our long-term better interests are, but because we're stupid, we keep taking shortcuts. We keep seeking to subvert society for our own selfish gain, even though we know that our long-term better interests are inextricably tied up with that organic society. But I'm getting ahead of myself. Let's just start off with the intellectual limitations. So life, the universe, and everything is infinite. The individual is finite. There is no way that by operation of the brain, one can expect to resolve all of the answers to all of life's questions. So you can't say, ah, it's liberty, or ah, it's equality, or equality, or ah, it's fraternity. You know, that's not an answer. And uh, anyone who comes up with that is either deluded or most likely wrong. So intellectual limitations, we're wary of big ideas, we're wary of one-size-fits-all solutions, what we like is experiment and heuristic process and that works best for a society because we are naturally drawn to these societies. Because we don't have all of the answers, we seek company of those who are in the same situation and of course that's desirable because we then have collective effort but also that sense of refuge is very very important. So society is inevitable and desirable. We're going to create it because we are lonely and scared and uh, exposed and it's desirable because we are, because by that collective effort we can make sense. But even then we have to be careful because we're stupid and we will consistently seek to subvert uh, society. Again, not because we're evil, but just because we're, we're human, I think is probably the best way uh, to put that. So that's human imperfection, uh, defined by, lim or human nature, sorry, defined by limitation, tripartite limitation, intellectual limitation, psychologically uh, dependent and psychologically flawed. So that's how we take, take about, uh, that's how we talk about human nature. So let's go on and let's talk about society. So again, why do societies form? Well, they, they form naturally uh, because um, we, we, are, we are scared. We, 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 we seek the company uh, of others. And um, 
that's a good thing because by this collective entity not only do we get solace not only do we get uh, that sense of community but also as a collective entity we have that potential stream of individuals that will allow us over time to come up with the answers that we need to the many many questions we face so the individual is finite life the universe and everything is infinite how do you get from the finite to the infinite well you have an infinite stream of individuals if you have an infinite stream of individuals if you have that organic or organic society that can go on and learn and evolve and acquire wisdom then there's a chance that we might get out of this the problem, of course, is that uh, freedom for the wolves means death for the sheep. Uh, it's more to do with liberalism. But the, 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 the issue we've got with society is that it will be challenged. It is going to be challenged both from within and from without. Other societies are going to challenge it, but equally from within, our own short-term psychological flaws are going to compel us to do bad things. And so we need the state to protect society and to steer society in a way that uh, in a way that is wise and beneficent. So organic society, organic in the sense that it can grow and learn, organic also in the sense that it is threatened, that it is vulnerable, and so it needs protecting. Good. So society, as we said, organic. Now the key to understanding. Um, uh, the economy for conservatives, particularly for traditional conservatives, is the notion of property. Property is tangled up in all of this. Property is massively important for your conservatives because it gives the individual greater sense of individual, a uh, greater sense of expression, sorry, and a sense of security. Now, when you guys go off to university, the first thing you're going to do is you're going to scatter stuff around your room. Now, that stuff that you scatter around a room is going to serve two purposes. First of all, it's going to give you a sense of security. So it'll be stuff from home, stuff that you brought with you. And then there's the stuff that you want to project, you know, the, the stuff that you want everybody else to come in, all the pictures of French films you've never seen and you're never going to see, a collection of jazz records that you're never going to listen to. You know, you're projecting something there to the outside world. So it's an extension of your individual individuality. It's an extension of your expression. These pictures that I've got around me, you know, Hopefully they're there because I like them because they make me feel well, maybe not secure, but they make me feel happy. But at the same time, you know, I'm trying to impress people who come in. I don't know. Maybe they're impressed. Maybe they just think I'm infantile. I really don't care. I'm past that. But anyway, so this idea of property as a link to our psychology, giving us a sense of self, giving us a greater sense of security. That's very, very important. And of course, if property is good, then more of it is better. And so we then come into the idea of property in the hierarchy and property as a measure of success. It is natural and indeed desirable to seek to, to accumulate uh, property. And the more property you have, clearly the more you are winning. And so it's a good thing. In terms of the economy, well, that's it. It's entirely up to you. There's uh, no government intervention. There's no uh, modeling. It's really just extreme laissez-faire. We protect property rights. Now, I'm not saying it's going to be a complete free-for-all. It's not... Uh, it's not catch as catch can, but we protect property rights because, well, for all of these very good reasons here. So we're not going to allow theft and larceny and all of that sort of stuff. So when we get when we talk about economic policy as being less fair, we're not allowing people to cheat and steal. We have a very clear sense of rules because you can't go around undermining people's security and sense of expression by allowing people to steal their stuff. So we have an economy that's based on less fair. Go out there and get them, boys. That's entirely up to you. Um, but the um, but property rights very very important. We're going to protect those so that people can reasonably go out and seek to acquire more property to make themselves more secure. So there we go. Economy is less a fair, and that leaves us with the state. So what is the role of the state? What is the nature of the state for a traditional conservative? Well, it's a natural thing. We have a natural hierarchy of skills, talents, and abilities. That's the way it is. Some people are better at things than others, some people are more ambitious. And uh, that means that we shouldn't expect society to be flat. Practically, what we want are those people who are steering society to be the most able. So it's desirable that the people at the top are the most able, the most ambitious, the most keen to survive. But having got to the top, they have that pragmatic sense. They can't just run society for their own benefit because obviously that's just going to cause society to collapse underneath it. It's going to, that's going to cause uh, so much disruption down the model that uh, society is likely to implode. So we need the people at the top to be pragmatic and to have the vision required to steer society through so that we can win. There's no final state here. It doesn't all end 
when everyone's equal or when everyone's free. You know, society with uh, in the conservative model just keeps going. We, we never achieve that end state because there's always something new to do. There's always something new to learn. There's always something that we can do better than we did before. So we have this, again, this organic model that's just trundling forward through time, steered by a beneficent, uh, pragmatic state. And that basically is your traditional conservatism. Um, human nature defined by limitations, society organic, economy laissez-faire, and the state authoritarian but paternalist or watched over by angels of loving grace. That's that for uh, traditional conservatism. Coming up next, that's going to be One Nation Conservatism. And I look forward to, short to, to, to talking through that with you very, very soon. In the meantime, take care. See you soon. Bye now.